Hello, thank you for joining us for this webinar. I would like to thank the members of the ISCB Academy of the COSI series of NetBio for the invitation to participate in this webinar. Today, I will present a multi-objective genetic algorithm to find active modules in multiplex biological networks, which is the project that I developed during my PhD that I defended last year in May. So I will start with a very brief introduction of the biology behind the project, and then I will explain to you in detail what the method that I developed does and what it does it for. So we can say that in general, all the cells within our body have the same DNA. And however, we have very different cell types, each of which has a very different function and morphology. And all this variety of cells is thanks to gene expression. So this means that in each type of cell, there is a particular combination of genes that are active or on a, at a given moment, and also the level of expression of those genes changes. Notably, gene expression is affected in disease states. This means that the level of expression of the genes varies in patients suffering from a genetic disease as compared to healthy controls. When a gene expresses, RNA is generated. We can therefore estimate the gene expression by measuring the amount of RNA present in a sample. And there are different techniques to do so, but two of the most widely used are RTQPCR and RNA-seq. We know that inside the cells, molecules such as proteins and RNA do not act isolated to accomplish the cellular functions, but they rather interact, forming complex systems of collaboration, communication, and signaling. And all these interactions, we can represent them in biological networks, where the nodes represent the molecules, and there is an edge joining two nodes if the corresponding molecules share an interaction. Thanks to the guilt by association principle, we know that molecules that participate in the same biological process tend to lie close to each other in this type of biological networks. We can therefore say that the interactions that are represented in a biological network are the basis for biological processes. So the project that I present you today is about the use of a genetic algorithm in order to analyze expression data and biological networks with the goal of finding the cellular processes that are deregulated between two conditions. And in particular, I am interested in knowing the cellular processes that are deregulated in patients suffering from a genetic disease as compared to healthy controls. So I have two main data sources. RNA-seq expression data is normally used to find the set of deregulated genes. This means that we want to find the list of genes which expression varies in patients as compared to controls. And we can then use that set of the regulated genes to look for an enrichment of functions, which means that we will go and look at the annotated function associated with each of those genes and see if there are any functions that appear more frequently than what would be expected by chance. Now, this sounds very good in theory, but the, in reality, we do not know the function for all the genes. And in addition, this type of enrichment analysis is biased to well-studied functions. And the second data source that I used are biological networks, which contain the information for cellular processes, pathways, and complexes. However, they are generic, which means that without a context, just by looking at them, we cannot know which cellular processes, pathways, and complexes are affected and or involved in the disease under study. But the good news is that we can integrate them to overcome their individual limitations and to have access to the active modules, which are highly connected subnetworks with an overall deregulation. An active module allows us to jump from the deregulation at the level of genes to the deregulation at the level of biological processes. And importantly, not all the genes in an active module have to be significantly differentially expressed which relaxes the constraint of classical functional enrichment analysis. A real biological network looks more or less like this one. 
So it's normally composed of thousands of nodes and up to hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of edges. In this figure, every subnetwork highlighted with a different color could be an example of an active module. The identification of active modules is an NP-hard problem, and therefore several approaches and heuristics have been proposed to solve it. The three main ones are based on greedy searches, simulated annealing, and genetic algorithms. Greedy searches are hill climbing-like. That is, given a set of possible moves, we will always prefer the one that maximizes the objective function or the one that maximizes the score. And Pinnacle set is such an algorithm. Let's look at this toy example. Let's suppose that we have this little network where the numbers inside each of the nodes represent the score of the nodes and that we want to find or select a subnetwork that is connected, adding one node at a time and starting at a random node but in order to add a new node, its score has to be higher than the previous one. So let's pick this random node to start the search. And then we have a look at its neighbors. The one with the maximum score has a score that is higher than the previous node. So we can add it. We continue the search with the new neighbors. We add a new node. But then we reach this point where none of the options that we have has a score that is higher than the previous node. We can therefore not add any other node, thus the greedy search stops. But the thing is that we got stuck in what is called a local optima, because we couldn't reach the node with the maximum score, which in this case represents the, the global optima. Another approach that has been used to look for active modules is simulated annealing, which is also like hill climbing, but with random choices, which means that favorable moves will always be kept, but unfavorable moves can also be accepted depending on the value of the temperature parameter, which is normally high at the beginning and decreases as the search progresses. This means that when we start the simulated annealing process, it is very likely that we will accept unfavorable moves as compared to the end of the process, when it, when it will be very unlikely that we keep a move that is unfavorable. And J-Active module falls in this category. So with the same two example that I showed you before, where in greedy searches, we reach to this point where no other no node could be added, simulated annealing can help us escape this local optima by accepting a node that has not a maximum score, but this help us reach the node with the maximum score. Therefore, we can find the, the global optima. Now, the third approach and last one that I will explain to you here that has been used to look for active modules is based on genetic algorithms, which emulate nat the natural evolution of a species. In a genetic algorithm, there is a population of individuals that is being analyzed simultaneously. Every individual of the population is a potential solution and has a score associated with it. The best individuals are tuned, whereas the worst are discarded. And then the population evolves until it converges. And cosine is such an algorithm. I just explained you here three different approaches and mentioned three different algorithms, but actually there are a lot of them, each of which has their own pros and cons. However, in general, only very few methods consider the density of interactions. This means that for a method that only considers the weight of the nodes, that is the score of the nodes, these two subnetworks are equivalent. But it is evident that even though both of them are connected, the first one is not very densely connected as compared to the second one. And this actually increases the probability of the second subnetwork that the nodes that are uh, represented here, the genes that are represented here, are actually participating in the same biological process. So it is important to take the density into account. And then another general limitation of current methods is that they can only analyze single networks. 
But however, we nowadays have access to several different biological networks, and it would be very interesting to analyze them simultaneously. So having these limitations in mind, I developed Mogamun, which is a multi-objective genetic algorithm that looks for highly connected subnetworks with an overall deregulation. So we translated this into two objective functions that are maximized or optimized simultaneously. The average node score represents the overall deregulation of the subnetwork and the density of interactions. Mogamun is based on NSGA2, which is another multi-objective genetic algorithm that has been widely tested in a high variety of problems. Mogamun follows 10 main steps. This is a general flowchart, and I will now explain you each of them in detail. So Mogamun starts by generating an initial population. This is a random process where, in this case, 100 subnetworks will be generated. Every subnetwork is a potential solution to a problem, so it means that every subnetwork represents potentially an active module. And this is one of the steps that I modified from NSGA2 in order to work with networks, because NSGA2 was not designed originally to work with networks. So in this case, I am interested in keeping my subnetworks connected. So what I do in order to have single connected components is that I randomly pick one significantly differentially expressed gene and use it as seed for a depth first search. And this is how I create any every subnetwork. Then in the second step, Mogamun evaluates the population. So for each of the subnetworks that it generated in the first step, it will calculate its average node score and density of interactions with the objective functions that I showed you before. Then it ranks the population, and Mogamun does this using Pareto dominance. So if you have a look at this figure, Every dot represents a subnetwork, and it is plotted in the coordinates that, co that correspond to its values for the average node score and the density of interactions. And the ranking is about finding out which subnetworks are better than the others. And um, we can say that a subnetwork dominates another one if its values for the average node score and the density of interactions are higher or equal than the second subnetwork, and at least for one of the two values, it has a better value, so it's it's higher. So the population during the ranking, the population is ordered with respect to the objective function values, and the best subnetworks are in the first part of front, which is here marked in black color, and they have a rank equal to one. So now that we have a population, we will use it to generate a new one. And in order to generate the population of children, which is the new population that we will create now, we first need to select parents. And Mogamun does, does, does that by tournament. So let's suppose that the tournament is of size two. Then Mogamun will randomly select two individuals from the population, it will compare them, and the one with the best rank wins the tournament. It's selected as a first parent, and then the process is repeated to select the second parent. Once a pair of parents has been selected, Mogamun applies the genetic operators of crossover and mutation, and it does this in order to generate children. So the crossover, is as it is shown in these figures. Let's suppose that we have these two parents, each of which is represented with a different color to ease the, the explanation. And then it will each pair of parents can generate two children. So each of the child will get a piece of each of the parents during crossover. And then during mutation, there are nodes being added and or removed from the children. And this is another of the steps that I adapted from NSGA2 in order to keep the children as single connected components. So as I said, a pair of parents can generate two children, but we need a full population of them. So we will repeat 
steps four and five, that is the selection of parents and the genetic operators of crossover and mutation several times. In this case, 50. And this will give us as a total 100 children, which in the sixth step, we will evaluate using the two objective functions as we did before. So now we have two populations, the initial one and the children. And in this step, Mogamun joins them in order to have a combined population of 200 subnetworks. And here I added an extra step in which I replace the duplicated individuals with random ones. And I do this in order to have a diversity in the population, a diversity of subnetworks in the population, and also to avoid premature convergence. In the next step, Mogamun ranks the combined population by Pareto dominance, as I explained you before. Then it is time to select a new population. And we do this by elitism. And in this case, using elitism allows us to keep the best subnetworks that were found in the initial population, so in the parents and in the children. And what we do here is that we will take the top 100 subnetworks and we will replace the initial population with them. So, so far, we completed one generation and we will use the population that we just selected in order to generate a new one. So we will go back to the step where we select the parents, apply the genetic operators of crossover and mutation, etc. And uh, we will do this until the population converges or until, stop, or until reaching the stopping criteria, which in my case is a given number of generations, which is equal to 500. So I will now show you how the performance of Mogamun compares with state-of-the-art methods. But I will do this in a single network because current methods can only analyze one network at a time. So in this comparison, the idea is to generate an artificial active module, which will be composed of 20 connected foreground genes, and the rest of the genes are the background genes. And the purpose is to see how good the methods are to find this, this active module. So here I will use uh, I will use two different protein-protein interaction networks with different characteristics, which are written here in this table, and two different data sets. The first one that I simulated follows a normal distribution, and the second one I sampled the expression data from real RNA-seq expression data that corresponds to TCGA breast cancer. And this, um, this benchmark, I took it from the paper published by Batra et al. in 2017. And here I compared Mokamun against J-active modules, cosine and pinnacle set which represent the, the most classical approaches that have been used to look for active modules. So here are the results using the first protein-protein interaction network and the expression data that follows a normal distribution. Every dot here represents an active module that was predicted for one of the methods. And this triangle represents the foreground genes that is the active module that we were looking for. So at the first glance, it seems like Pinnacle set is the one that found the best results because the active modules that it found have a very high average node score and a very high density of interactions. But the problem with these active modules or subnetworks is that they were very, very small. So when I had a look at them, it turns out that they started at sizes of only two nodes. And if we are looking for the regulated cellular processes and we only have two nodes interacting, we cannot know for sure if they are actually involved in the same biological process or if, it, if the results are meaningful. So after discussing with our colleagues who are biologists, we came to the conclusion that the minimum size that was acceptable in order to have enough information to interpret the active modules was 15 nodes. 
So I removed all of the subnetworks from this set that had less than 15 nodes. And in the missing results, you can see that Mokamun found the best active modules. These are the results from the second experiment. So with the second protein-protein -protein interaction network and the expression data that I sampled from TCGA breast cancer. And this time we have more or less the same pattern as before. So binacle set initially had the best results, but in this particular case, we also have some active modules that were found by J-active modules that were also better than those found by Mogamun. But once again, after filtering for small subnetworks, the results of Mogamun are clearly the best. And here you can see that there is one active module that was found by J active modules that is also good. But in this case, it is evident that Mogamun finds a more diverse set of results. So this is why we consider it to be better. And even though it is almost as good as one of the active modules from Mogamun, you can see that it's a little bit, um, it, it, it has a lower average snow score and a little bit lower density of interactions. I also compared these results using the F1 score, which allows us to see how good the methods were to find the foreground genes that are, that is the true positives while avoiding choosing the background genes which are the false positives and you can see that mokamun f1 scores are higher than the rest but here i want to highlight that the four methods were able to find most or all of the foreground genes but the reason why the F1 scores of Mogamun are higher is because Mogamun selected less background genes than the other three methods. So going back to the objective functions that I showed you before, this formula for the density of interactions is quite simple, but it's enough if you only have a single network. But as I told you, this is one of the limitations of current methods that can only analyze one network at a time. So the, uh, what we propose in Mogamon is to analyze multiplex networks. A multiplex network is like a network of networks. So in this case, it's a network composed of different layers where each layer is a different network the set of nodes is shared in all the layers, and then every node is connected to itself across the layers. For the experiments that I will show you next, I used a multiplex network composed of three layers. As I said, the set of nodes is common in all the layers, and you can see that each of them has a very different number of interactions. So I used a protein-protein interaction network one containing the pathways and another one containing the correlation of expression, which I will refer to as co-expression. We therefore adapted the calculus of the density of interactions in order to be able to handle the multiplex network. So now I will show you the performance of Mokamun using real use cases data sets. In this case of FSHD, which is a rare genetic disease, and breast cancer, an unfortunately very common disease. So FSHD stands for facial scapulohumeral muscular dystrophy. And here I analyzed three different data sets, each of which comes from a different types of cells. So we have um, biopsies of muscle cells, myoblasts and myotubes. And each of these data sets has a very different number of significantly differentially expressed genes. So we can see that we have two with very few significantly differentially expressed genes and one with a couple of hundred of one of significantly differentially expressed genes. So this is a summary of the results. I would like to highlight that even for the data sets that had 
less significantly differentially expressed genes, Mokamun was able to find active modules. So in this case, the number of interesting genes that we would like to look at increased from six to more than 100. And when we had a couple of hundred of interesting genes, Mogamun was able to filter this list in order to leave only less than 150 genes. So this is how the active modules look like. Here I show you two examples, each of, when, each of them comes from a different data set and they are associated with particular biological functions. Like for instance, this one is associated with transition and regulation of cell cycle. And this one is associated to DNA binding transcription factor, binding and response to endogenous stimulus. So in these active modules, the, the color of the nodes represents the, the regulation. So we have red for upregulated genes in patients as compared to healthy controls, and green for downregulated genes in, in patients as compared to healthy controls. And the significantly differentially expressed genes are marked with a black border. Then the color of the edges varies depending on the layer of the multiplex from which that edge come from, comes from. So from this first active module, the part that caught my attention was this one because it contains the most upregulated genes. But the thing is that they are connected only through co-expression um, edges, which means that they do not share any protein-protein interaction and they do not belong to the same pathway, which means that they after all, might not be involved in the same biological process. And then we have this other active module in which we have a combination of edges, so edges coming from all the layers. And then we have four out of the six significantly differentially expressed genes. So we can then study each of the active modules that Mokamun found to uncover the, 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 the regulated cellular processes in FSHD patients. So the second use case is with um, RNA-seq expression data of TCGA corresponding to breast cancer. So in this case, there are more than 1,000 patients which correspond to any of the two more stages that I showed here in the table. And I compared each of the group of patients against one, 112 controls. And in each of the cases, you can see that I found thousands of, of significantly differentially expressed genes, considering both the log fold change and the FDR. So I applied Mogamun. I started first with a comparison of all the patients disregarding the tumor stage as compared to healthy controls. And I found a single active module which contained 10 highly deregulated, significantly differentially expressed genes. And you can see that this active module is really highly connected and it seems like it contains a lot of edges from the three layers of the multiplex. This active module is associated with DNA replication. And of course, it makes sense that DNA replication is deregulated in cancer, but I wanted to know more. I was actually disappointed to see only one active module being retrieved. So I decided to see what was going on. The hypothesis behind this very intriguing, intriguing result was that maybe the different tumor stages are so different between them that Mokamun found only like the what was common in all of them, which is DNA replication, as you can see here. So what I did was to take individual tumor stages and compare them against the healthy controls. So I took three tumor stages, the one with more samples, and in all of the cases, I found the same active module. So having a look at the number of genes that are shared, uh, the number of significantly differentially expressed genes that are shared in all these sets 
that I analyzed, we can see that there are more than 1,000 common significantly differentially expressed genes. And it actually seems like this is the most active module because it was, it was retrieved in every single run of Mogamun, independently of the combination, as I already said. So I was, as I said, a bit disappointed. And on the other hand, I also wanted to know more about breast cancer. So I decided to change the scientific question. And is, instead of wondering what was different between patients and controls, I decided that it would be interesting to see what was different between different tumor stages. So I analyzed the tumor stages 2B versus 1A which have more than 600 significantly differentially expressed genes. And Mogamun was able to find, in this case, we went to finding only one active module when we compared patients as compared to controls, to finding 23 active modules, which include 151 genes that uh, have um, this set of genes include 32 of the significantly differentially expressed ones. And we see that we still find the DNA replication represented in, in uh, at least one of the active modules, but we also find other biological processes that are deregulated. For instance, this active module is associated to signaling and cell communication. So I also analyzed these other two, compared these other two tumor stages, so 3C and 2B, which also have more than 600 significantly differentially expressed genes. And once again, as in the previous case, Mokamon was able to find more than one active module. So here I have 14 active modules, which contain 76 genes that include 21 significantly differentially expressed genes. And you can see that we find, again, DNA replication. So it means that DNA replication, even though it is also differentiated in patients as compared to controls, it also varies between two more stages. But uh, here I have another active module that I showed you as an example that is associated to tissue development, cell death, and cell differentiation. So it is interesting to use Mokamun to answer different types of scientific questions, but in this particular case, it would be interesting to collaborate with experts in breast cancer in order to find more and to, to interpret actually the, the active modules. So to conclude the main part of my talk, I would like to say that Every active module that Mokamun finds is an alternative path that we can explore to see if there is a biological processes behind that was deregulated in the disease that we are studying. And also Mokamun is able to add biological knowledge to expression data. This biolog biological knowledge comes from the use of biological networks. And notably, Mokamun can be applied to study any genetic disease. This is why I showed you uh, an, an application on a very rare genetic disease and on a very unfortunately common genetic disease. And in addition, Mogamun is quite versatile because if you have too little information, Mogamun can help you to complement it as it was in the case of the study of FSHD. And if you have too much information, Mogamun can help you to filter it. And to the best of my knowledge, Mokamun is the first method that is adapted to analyze multiplex networks, and it is available as a bioconductor package. So before ending this talk, I would like to tell you very briefly about the project in which I am currently working on. So I am part of the MedClassNet consortium, which gathers four teams from France and Germany, and we study the metabolism. So in this case, we have experimental data that is metabolomics data and genome scale metabolic networks, which we want to use to build a multi-layer network. So here uh, in this image, you can see what we want to do. So we want to build several networks from the experimental, net, from the experimental data and join them to the genome scale metabolic network. 
And this is because we want to solve the gap filling problem. Because sometimes what you see in real experiments, which can be represented in the experimental networks, is not completely represented in the knowledge base, which is the genome scale metabolic network. So we would like to see in which way we can use the experimental networks to complement the genome scale metabolic network and vice versa, because we can also use the genome scale metabolic network to filter spurious links, for instance, from, from the experimental layers. But in this project, one of the most challenging tasks is the the definition of the interlayer connections, because in order to see to which metabolite a node from an experimental layer corresponds to is not straightforward. So it would be interesting to participate in another seminar in the future to show you more about this project. But for the moment, this is ongoing work, and this is the only thing that I have to show you for now. So I would like to thank all of our collaborators, especially all the authors from the Mokamun paper and all the members of the consortium in which I'm currently working. And thank you for your attention. I will be glad to listen to your feedback and to answer to any questions that you may have. Excellent. So it seems like a very interesting tool. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Um, so we already have one question here. Um, when generating your subnetworks, you mentioned that you randomly choose a differentially expressed gene. Are there any mm -hmm. other criteria for generating that pool beyond being differentially expressed? Mm, no, in this case, uh, we. the thing is that the search space is very, very big. So we wanted to restrict it in order to the algorithm to really focus on interesting areas. And these are the ones that surround the differentially expressed genes. So the criteria that we used it was that, but if you have, for instance, some genes that are not significantly differentially expressed genes, but you know that are mutated in the, in the disease that you are studying, maybe you can use this as seeds instead of the significantly differentially expressed genes. Oh, okay. That makes sense. You could customize it to fit on whatever you were looking to investigate. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> uh, next question. Um, in the multilayer networks, um, uh, in, sorry, uh, will you, uh, bleh, in the multilayer networks mm -hmm. you will construct in your new project uh, with metabolic data, uh, you have directed networks. Can Mogamoon work in this context? So yes, indeed, they will be, so some of them will be directed, but actually it depends on the type of network that you want to generate. Because if I go back to, to here, with the genome scale metabolic network, yeah, the original one is actually a bipartite network because it contains um, the metabolites and also the reactions. But from it, you can generate different graphs so one is the compounds graph in which you will connect two nodes. So you will only have the nodes that will represent the compounds and two of them will be connected if one is the substrate uh, of a reaction and the other one is the, the product. So in this case, we might have only undirected networks. And in the case of Mokamun, um, let me think. Yes, I think I think it can work even if you have directed networks, but it will just mm, what will be different will be the nodes that you can reach from one node. So, for instance, when you generate the new individuals, you you will have to take into account the the direction of the edges. But yes, I think it can be adapted to work with directed networks. Interesting. Um, now, I apologize if this is a, a naive question. I, I didn't do much networking work in, in my own background. Um, what exactly is the gap filling problem? I've heard it come up before, but I don't have a good understanding of it. Yes, the gap filling problem. Uh, no, it's not a naive question at all. So <laughs> it can have different like faces. Like you can look, for instance, for missing notes in one of the layers or for missing edges. 
So um, maybe you can find or you can, yeah, you can find a case in which you might have a node in the experimental network that you cannot find in the genome scale metabolic network. So if you already identify the rest of the nodes and this one is missing, you will conclude that it is a node that is missing in the genome scale metabolic network. Or maybe if you have um, a connection here in the knowledge base network that is not present in the experimental network, it can mean that it's missing or the other way around that um, if you find some edges that are con that are consistently found in all the experimental layers and you do not find it in the genome scale metabolic network, then maybe there are some reactions missing. So it is basically about finding or identifying missing nodes and or edges. That sounds extremely complex. <laughs> yes, I think <clears throat> it will be. Uh, I'm, I'm also a newbie in this type of uh, problem solving, but I have some ideas on how we can solve it, but <laughs> let's see I if they work. <laughs> I will be interested to follow that because that seems like it would be very informative uh, uh, amount of data. Um, speaking of, actually, um, <clears throat> while I give everyone a, a chance to type out any questions they may still have, um, my background comes from plants. Um, the, the networks you used here used human examples. Mm -hmm. Is it difficult to shift from, like, a, across a kingdom like that to go from animals to plants, or if you went into to bacteria or archaea, does, do the same principles apply, or would it take, like, an entire retooling to, to allow the same kind of approach? Not at all. Actually, uh, Mokamun takes as one of the inputs that it takes is the layers that you want to use for your multiplex network. So you can feed it with networks that come from human or that come from the elegance or plants or any type of network that you want to use. And this is, this is a parameter, an input parameter. So it's really something that you will have to provide. And in the case that you want to use the same networks as I did for the paper and for the examples that I showed you here, they are also available, but you can use your own.